how do you think Keir Starmer's doing? What's going on? Um, is he, we talked last about he's in, he is in trouble. Is that continuing? Is the light at the end of the tunnel? I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. If anything, we've seen the freebie scandal continue to grow. We've seen the latest revelations, of course, with Taylor Swift. The fact that he actually met her, the fact she contacted Sue Gray, or her mother, contacted Sue Gray directly, and then all of a sudden she's getting a royal cavalcade, if you will, to take her from her hotel through to Wembley. We've seen Starmer's poll ratings drop to the worst of any prime minister this country has had in the first 100 days. I don't see any, and uh, sorry, and another manifesto pledge broken with the national insurance rises where they said they weren't going to do that. That is now going to happen. What they've tried to do this week, of course, is when they had their um, investment summit, as they called it, and now they're now they're trying to brag pe- black people and say that they've managed to get thirty eight thousand new jobs, and I think it was sixty three billion in new investment in the UK. But people have been pouring over these figures now, as they do. And it turns out that a lot of these jobs it says it's going to provide actually aren't going to be provided. What it is, it's, it, to be fair, it will actually keep some jobs in this country, but it won't provide 38,000 new jobs. And a lot of the investment that they're, they're saying was secured at this summit was actually secured under the previous Tory government. So, for example, your carbon capture stuff, your um, the data centre, the, what they call it now, AI centre, whatever it is, it's going to be in the T side or something like that up in the northeast. That was all done by the previous Conservative government. Uh, 12 billion with uh, Iberola, I think they're called. That was twelve. That was done under the previous Conservative government. Uh, wind farms contracts, that was done under the previous Conservative government. <laughs> There's really very little that's actually come out of this investment summit that is actually done by this Labour government at all. So if you can see some light at the end of the tunnel, I think you're, you're a better man than me. To be fair to Labour, every government will take the credit for the successes laid down by the previous government. Every government does that. They will take credit for everything. Just like they're taking credit now for a drop in interest rates. Um, And they'll they'll take credit. They'll always take credit for something if it's positive. They don't care who's done it, but they'll take credit for it. Um, the, the, The investments is a strange one because they didn't invite the richest man in the world. Um the owner of Twitter, Elon Musk, didn't invite him at all. Um, And then one of their ministers, I think it's the minister for, I I forgot her name now and and position, but um, she then started insulting P&O Ferries. Oh, Louise Hague, they're transport, isn't she? And now they're threatening not to, or they're delaying an investment of a billion pounds. To be fair, if they've got a billion pounds to invest, it will probably go ahead anyway because it's taken them years to organise that, raise the capital, work out how they're spending it. But the fact you can have a government of the UK slagging off a multinational company who wants to invest in the UK is just student union politics. It's a cut off your nose to spite your face. It wasn't just her either. I mean, yes, she was the one who um, has become the main story, if you will. But Angela Rayner said the same thing about this company. Keir Starmer said the same thing about this company. To quote Keir Starmer, he said, it makes him sick to the stomach that uh, what they call DP World or P&O Ferries, whichever one you want to refer to, were doing this to workers. And, you know, to an extent, I have a bit of sympathy for that. But it's okay when you're in opposition to slag these people off. But then all of a sudden, you're begging them to invest in the country. And in this case, invest in what is um, a container port, isn't it? Expanding the container port inside London. But you simply can't do that. And then what... As the CEO of that company turned around and said they weren't going to attend this summit any longer and they weren't going to invest the billion pound, all of a sudden, number 10 are on the phone, the prime minister's on the phone to this company, and lo and behold, they changed their minds. Now, I'd like to know, and I'm sure the public would like to know as well, what have they had to promise DP World or p Ferries to actually get this investment back on the table again? Are they going to get even... Yeah, are they going to get subsidies? Are they going to get, you know, God knows what. They've not come back to the table for no reason. They had the government by the balls and they've just probably taken them to the cleaners just so they could announce one minor success. Because in the grand scheme of things, a billion quid, I know it's a lot of money, of course, but it's not, you know, groundbreaking sums of money in terms of government. No, it's not. And what we need to think about, really, is 
do we have any right? Or does a government, we do, because we're individuals and we can have our own opinions, but does a government have the right to criticise a business that was doing everything legally? May not have been ethically, that down to our own opinion, but they didn't break any laws. It was all legal. If a government doesn't like the way businesses work, the simple answer, you change the law when you're in power. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, a lot of people don't want to talk about this, but the Labour Party actually did a massive fire and rehire project themselves when they were in opposition. So it's completely hypocritical for them to turn around and say that somebody else can't do it, a private business, but it's okay for a political party to do it, one that rails against any sort of big business or anyone who's successful at all, which is exactly what the Labour Party seemed to enjoy doing. Yeah, I mean, it, there's an article the other day, something like 200 Labour MPs at the moment employ staff on the contracts the Labour Party have said they're going to abolish. So why did those MPs employ those staff on those contracts anyway? Why haven't they changed those contracts? If they're not good enough for everybody, why are Labour MPs? And it's not their money. It's only expenses. It's our money. It's not their money. So why are they still using those contracts that they're saying are evil, that exploit people? Why are they using them? Well, exactly. It's one rule for them, one rule for us, isn't it? Hypocrisy. Yeah, of course, yeah. And what made it worse for me with that Louise Haig um, is that, Starmer came out immediately after and said that Rayner's, well, a spokesperson for number 10 came out and said that Rayner and Haig's comments didn't reflect the view of the government. Yet it was found out afterwards that the careless words Louise Haig used, used, in fact, they weren't careless, they were completely deliberate, but she had to get it cleared by number 10 before she said that, and it was cleared by number 10. She was allowed to make this speech and grandstand to the rest of the country, showing how virtuous she was. So number 10 did clear it. They did did sanction these words. And then all of a sudden, they get scared because it's putting off investment, which is exactly what this government are doing now, including Rachel Reeves, by the way, who's a disaster of a chancellor, who's going to absolutely destroy businesses by the time this budget comes around. It's quite fitting that it's taking place the day before Halloween because it is going to be an absolute nightmare for uh, this economy. Yeah. I, I would just make one point there, which is I don't think they backtracked because they're scared of losing a billion pounds of investment. I don't think they care. They backtracked because, again, they had negative publicity and everything now is about containing negative publicity. I think they, if that got signed off by number 10, which it probably did, then they don't care about a billion pound because the virtue signaling is more important than a billion pound and so many jobs. But what's more important than virtue signaling is having good press because we might lose the next election. We might not be in office in six months' time. Keir Starmer, as I keep saying, will be out by Christmas. So it's it's hypocrisy at the worst level. It's not about us. It's not about them having morality. It's about them just wanting the gravy train to continue that bit longer. Yeah, and like you said, I mean, yeah, I, I'm I'm with you. Starmer will be gone fairly soonish, but the government, unfortunately, or the Labour Party, as we're stuck with now, they are uh, they're going to be in power for the next. I said four years last time, but I, you could even see it going the full term five years. Unfortunately, as I think I said previously, the majority is just too big for anybody to get rid of. It would have to be something cataclysmic to to bring down a party that's got a majority of 170 odd. As as Harold Wins as Harold Wilson, Harold Wilson once said, events there boy, events. Something will happen in the, I think the next two years, um, if not sooner, an international event, an international incident, something at home, something we cannot foresee, something that's never happened before will 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 force a general election. I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure how it's going to happen. But you're right. Me and you can't force it. The public can't force it. The Tories can't force a general election. It doesn't matter how bad they get. Can't force a general election. Something, but something will happen that will put it on into disarray, which will split the Labour Party in half, and eventually they'll have to go back to the public. I think there's a lot of civil wars going on anyway inside the party. I think that that's fairly obvious. But again... Is it a big enough civil war to bring down a prime minister who's got a majority of 170-something? Not yet. Not, not, not at this point, no. And 
it's it's going to take a lot of by-election defeats, which I can see coming, by the way. And when you've got a part a new parliament, there's always people in there more than you think. Actually, you've been up to no good somewhere or another, and that tends to come to light sooner or later. So there will be by-elections that come up fairly quickly, but. And you, you can see Labour, sorry, losing those as well. And you can see reform, depending on where they are in the country, I could probably see reform gaining some, maybe the Tories gaining some, maybe even the Lib Dems and the Greens gaining some. But it's just such a mountain to climb to get rid of these people. And the event that would have to take place, would, it, would have, it would have to be one of the biggest political scandals this country's ever seen, maybe the biggest. It would have to be another expenses scandal times 10 or something to get rid of a government that's, I mean, to get rid of this party, sorry, not get rid of the government. The government can be got rid of quite easily, I think. Starmer has surrounded himself by people that want his job. And that's what that's what a lot of them do, of course. So you've already got people like Wes Streeting, Angela Rayner, Rachel Reeves that have been on manoeuvres. You can see them speaking. Now, none of them are up to the job, of course, but they're all out there speaking like they are going to be the next leader of the party. They can see that Starmer is damaged. They can see that Starmer is weak. There's people briefing inside number 10 against the guy. The amount of information leaking out of there at the moment is absolutely unbelievable. And Angela Rayner, who I have no time for whatsoever, has been used as a scapegoat by Starmer repeatedly to deliver bad news, such as housing targets, which have already been announced to be having some sort of refresh because they've already failed three months in. As Nigel Farage pointed out, to keep up with the levels of immigration in this country, you'd have to build a house every two minutes, which is impossible to do. And people aren't simply going to give up their green spaces and countryside and things just because Angela Rayner wants to build another council estate, which is ultimately her aim. But she will be the one, if anybody, to bring Starmer down. Because, you know, I actually thought, sorry, to carry, I thought um, she had more political nous, actually, than what she's got. But she hasn't. She's just been happy to take any job that Starm has given her and then completely been thrown under the bus by him. She's actually got less political intelligence than he has, and that's that's saying something. But just like both those politicians, there's people behind them. She's, she's a front for the type of Labour government certain people want. She's always been a front for that. Um, she's not a leader. She's not a visionary. She's just a front, just like Keir Starmer is. Here's an example of what could bring this Labour government down. Middle Eastern war. All kicks off more in the Middle East. Israel sends tanks into Lebanon, into Jordan, into the West Bank and uh, Gaza. Uh, Americans join the Israelis. Uh, Trump wins the election and says, I don't deal with a Labour government in the UK. Um, I don't deal with them at all. Uh, the Labour Party splits because... Keir Starmer wants to support Israel. His party want to go a war against Israel. Um, it, it, would, it could take something like that, which could easily start any day now. Um, and it'll be something that size, that's unexpected, that we have no control over, which will bring down this government. That's a fair point about the Middle East and war. I've made, I've made a similar point about Trump actually myself as well. I mean, he spoke about Starmer the other week and he said, I mean, it was being polite, obviously, but he said he's, he's done very well to win the election. He seems quite popular. Like Trump's obviously not very in touch with the British people on that. But oh, fair enough, he did well to win the election. Trump has been very polite about him, but is he really going to deal with some half-wit like David Lammy when he turns up there after calling Trump a neo-Nazi, what was it, fascist sociopath or something like that? Trump should, and probably, knowing Trump probably will turn around and say, don't even think of sending him over here because there's no way that I'll be dealing with him. And who can blame him? Why, why would you? David Lammy is the biggest embarrassment to this country at the moment, and that's saying something. He's absolute calamity. Everywhere he goes, every time he opens his mouth, he just makes an absolute mess of everything. And when it comes to the UK and America, who do you think needs needs the other the most? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so, I mean, it's all stacked in one way, isn't it? It's all stacked one way. Of course it is, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I can see that happening. And what all, what else is going to damage Labour is, I've said this before, chatting to you, Nigel Farage will be the unofficial American ambassador for, for the UK. That would be ultimate humiliation, wouldn't it, for, um, for Starmer? If he had to... I mean, even if it was unofficial, you'd still have Farage going over there doing UK business, 
or doing business on behalf of the UK, sorry, with Donald Trump, because he won't speak to Starmer. <laughs> that would that, that's beyond humiliation. But can you imagine him coming back, standing up in Parliament and going, I've just secured a deal with uh, the Americans. Um, I've emailed it to Keir Starmer. All he has to do is sign it. But I'll tell you now, it's a fantastic deal. And then release it to the press. And then Keir, what does Keir Starmer do? He either signs this good deal or he rejects it because it's come from Nigel Farage. That humiliates him. These are the situations that a politician doesn't want to be in. But Farage is the most dangerous person inside Parliament, politically, I mean. Mm. He's the most... He's the reformer, the biggest... There may be a very small party at the moment, but they are the biggest threat to Labour inside Parliament at the moment, without a doubt. They're the only opposition, to be quite honest with you. There's, there's nobody else. There's the, the Tories are in chaos at the moment. I don't see any end to that anytime soon. When's the leadership contest due to end? Is it middle of November? It's so self-indulgent and it's taken so long that people have lost interest. No one's, no one gives a toss who's going to win this leadership contest. And I used to be a Tory member and I, I don't care. Did you enjoy that video? I think you did. Come on now, hit that bell, subscribe, comment. Let's build this channel. I need more followers. I need more subscribers. Be part of the journey. See you soon.